Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the GSMC Fantasy Sports Podcast. As always, in this time of finals time, we switch from basketball to hockey, where Game 2 of the Stanley Cup Finals between the Panthers and Oilers took place. And to be honest with you guys, this kind of was more dominant than decisive for the Florida Panthers, a 4-1 victory, ultimately. And it just goes to show you that much like the Boston Celtics in the NBA, the Florida Panthers are another team that is just so well-structured and will always be there in the end. But before we get into that kind of mindset, let's transition to the fantasy stats from last night and who the fantasy stars for this game were. Obviously, you always got to talk about him when you talk about the Florida Panthers. One of the main reasons why they are even here. The brick wall that is Sergei Bobrovsky. Not as many fantasy points as his shutout game one win because he did not face a high level of shots. 5.6 on the night. One goal, but only 18 shots he faced. Still a very solid performance from him. But if you want an unsung hero for this Florida Panthers team that's really stepped up his game very unexpectedly, how about second line winger Evan Rodriguez? 8.5 fantasy points last night. 1 plus minus. Two goals last night and three goals in two games ultimately in this series. Just the depth of this Florida Panthers team is what is carrying them right now and is scary to behold. Speaking of depth, Anton Lundell, another fantastic game from him. The third line center, 6.5 fantasy points, two assists, one plus minus. Did not have any points the last game in game one. So just go to show all these Florida Panthers players are stepping up. On the Edmonton Oilers side of things, I can really only mention two players because the only two players who got a goal and an assist, the only goal and assist in Edmonton Oilers Cup run right now. Connor McDavid got the assist, only 4.5 fantasy points, 1 plus minus, and Matthias Ekholm with somehow 7 fantasy points in a game where he lost by 3 goals as a defenseman. He obviously scored the only goal for the Oilers in this series. Now, I really, really think that this just felt like a neck-on-throat performance by the Florida Panthers. Obviously, when you look at the Edmonton Oilers, yes, they have the kind of fundamental game plan in certain aspects of the way they play that could be able to pull out a game or two against Florida, but ultimately Florida just looks better prepared. They absorb the Edmonton Oilers with relative ease. They have a mindset both defensively and in the attack in both zones, and right now they're just sucking the energy out of an Edmonton Oilers team that has had a fantastic run to this point. If you're the Edmonton Oilers, you just have to hope right now. That's the only thing I can think about to get back into the series. And right now, the only two things in my mind in which the Oilers can bank on perhaps getting better as this series progresses are the two strengths they've had both in the regular season and the postseason. Their power play and their penalty kill. Because right now, that is where they look like they have their priorities set. In even strength, they just look lifeless. They look lost. Their main source of attack and even strength right now is basically either Connor McDavid or whatever line is playing's main center just racing up the ice and hoping guys follow him. And it's just slow in the build-up in the offensive zone when you just need more speed. The goal here for Edmonton is to move Sergei Bobrovsky's sight line. Right now, Sergei Bobrovsky is too comfortable. You're not getting shots from unexpected places. Yes, you had a couple of key moments last night where you kind of created different shots, but right now, the name of the game for Edmonton is just creating even more shots in ways they know they can. That's the best way to put it right now. So, let's go to the Edmonton power play, for example. The Edmonton power play is so potent because the Edmonton Oilers know how they're going to set up each and every single occasion, no matter what line. Let's say it's the first line, the first power play unit. You have Connor McDavid entering the offensive zone. He's going to be the maestro. He's going to pull the strings. He's going to try and find the pass. He's going to try to drive past the net and pull it back 
for Zach Hyman. Zach Hyman is ultimately, in my opinion, the most pivotal player in both even strength and in the power play for Edmonton right now because he's the guy who's mainly going to be tasked with kind of screening Sergei Bobrovsky, kind of, kind of distracting him, kind of pulling away his sight line so that other guys can get more shot production. But ultimately, he as well needs to be able to produce a tap-in. Obviously, Sergei Bobrovsky is so strong at stopping shots in the five-hole that Edmonton really needs to figure out a way to just get one past him, and maybe it opens up Bobrovsky a little bit more. But Zach Hyman, in that role, just needs to make himself more of a presence, especially in terms of the power play, because that's where Edmonton needs to take advantage. And then there's Leon Dreisaitl. Leon Dreisaitl is on the other side of the ice, on the right wing. And ultimately, right now, he's probably the most dangerous player in the Edmonton's first power play unit. I think that his tight angle shot last night proved that he can be one of those missing pieces to the puzzle in terms of trying to find ways past Bobrovsky where it's not conventional, you know, try and tap it in or a Bouchard long-range shot, which we'll get to in a minute. So Leon Dreisaitl just needs to develop more ways to kind of distract from what McDavid wants to do, which is enter the zone and then pass back out. So... Leon Dreisaitl in the series is definitely going to be pivotal, especially as it shifts to Edmonton. And last but not least, one of the more intriguing aspects of this Edmonton power play is Evan Bouchard, the farthest person out of side of the offensive zone, kind of on the edge between the neutral zone and the offensive zone, and he's known for his long-range shots. That's his forte, and the reason why he's one of the best goal scorers and point scorers in the NHL playoffs right now. Evan Bouchard ultimately, in my opinion, is the second most pivotal player on the Edmonton power play because in terms of shot stopping, Sergei Bobrovsky is not as strong on his blocker side, both of his blocker sides, where he has long-range shots that either go over his shoulder or above his pads. He's not as good as that as saving shots in the five hole. So Edmonton really needs shots that are elevated, that are above his blockers, above his pads, that can find the way into the back of the net, and Evan Bouchard is the player for that. I've talked about it yesterday. I'm going to talk about it again now because that's the the main bread and butter for Edmonton right now. You have to understand that Sergei Bobrovsky can only be beat in so many different ways. And right now, that's probably your best shot. Obviously, their goal last night was kind of a tap-in where Sergei Bobrovsky somehow let it through his legs, Matthias Ekholm kind of got off the hook for kind of a, a bad shot, in my opinion. But still, that's the way you get past Bobrovsky. You elevate your shots, try and get it over his big uh, glove side, blocker side, pad, what have you. That's the main way forward. In terms of the penalty kill, honestly, I never thought I would be saying this, but right now in terms of fantasy and in real life as well, I'm high on Oilers defensemen. I don't think they're necessarily the problem. It's just the fact that the Panthers just have their offensive game plan down pat. They're just so interconnected with each other no matter how you transition from line to line. It it just really gasses this, this Oilers defense that right now is playing kind of decent hockey. I can't really say they're doing anything poorly. I know that Chris Knobloch wants to rotate in and out as the series develops and as defensemen kind of underperform, but still... I do think that right now the Oilers' strengths in this series are their defensemen. And obviously, that comes with Stuart Skinner as well. So, and he's a different issue. But right now, the Oilers need to bank on their penalty kill. I think their penalty kill was one of their bright spots last night. They did have some decent penalty kills last night. Obviously, the loss of Warren Fogle was huge for Edmonton because not only is he a fantastic two-way center. It really kind of changed Chris Knobloch's initial plan defensively where he needed that more physical kind of center. But still, I just think that the Florida Panthers are just handling everything as it comes. They know how to shut down superstars. They've seen kind of these superstar teams in the Eastern Conference, not to the extent of the Oilers, but still, it's just prepared them. They've been here before they have the stanley cup final experience that edmonton can't necessarily rely on and their team is just so well built kudos to bill zito for finding guys 
much like Brad Stevens in the NBA. We're going to talk about this also tomorrow when we go more in depth on these two teams and how they were built. But still, the Florida Panthers right now are just absorbing everything Edmonton throws at them. And Edmonton look meeker than they've ever been right now. They look lifeless. So, for Florida, the goals moving forward, just stay the way you are playing right now because honestly, it's carrying you to that first Stanley Cup final in franchise history. This could be a sweep if Florida just stays within their system, keep doing what they're doing. Edmonton, power play and penalty kill. It's what got you here in the first place. So rely on that. But that should just about do it for this segment. I love talking about these different finals. It's honestly so exhilarating and thrilling to be able to have two fantastically weird and wacky finals in very different sports. So I'm just glad that I'm able to get to talk to about them with you guys. But coming up next, we are transitioning to the fantasy kind of basketball football world now that these seasons are finishing up and we're going to be coming back in a segment about fantasy football and who ESPN believes will exceed their projections for next season should be a good one um we will be right back with that <laughs> 